Korsha, The Weaving of Shadows, narrated by the Onyx Archivist. The living only exists because of the dead, and even in death they carry us forward. It was a macabre thought, but Korsha knew it was true, more than most. Even now, as she trudged through the snow and ash, their flakes smothering the world around her, slowly burying it alive beneath their duality, she knew the dead were watching her. The eyes of the ancestral spirits judged her. She hoped they'd whisper a prayer to the goddess for her, though she doubted they saw her as worthy. The thought made the brand on her chest itch beneath her armor. A howling wind scraped the ground before her. Its passing left a tear in the sooty blanket that had smothered the world. Korsha stopped, her gaze pulled down to the newly formed gash. Dropping onto her heels, her underarmor creaked as she inspected the yellow band that marred the ground. She swiped the snow aside, revealing the weathered and pockmarked sign. Her breaths came out in hot, misty pants as she revealed the bands of purple that lined the sign's perimeter. She stood up, ignoring the slight ache in her back. The Dominion's military emblem was etched upon its surface. Typical brutish threats, Korsha thought as she scanned the sign. Dominion property. In she huffed, a shiver running down her spine, not from the threat, but from the cold. She'd heard that the northern regions suffered the wrath of winter, but she had been truly unprepared for its intensity. Her armor could only compensate for so much. It at least fought back the cold and kept her muscles loose. Trudging forward, her eyes were fixed upon the hazy gray blotch before her. It grew, took shape, solidified. Now towering over her, she stopped. The gray concrete was marred by some purple substance. She grimaced, wondering if someone had actually tried to break in and met the business end of the auto turrets that were lined across the top of the wall. A frosted, bitter breath escaped her lips as she searched for the gate. The storm had confused her, drawn her off court. She'd missed her insertion point. She eyed the auto turrets. Could she outpace them? She shook her head. Probably not. Of course, they'd be placed on a redundant tertiary backup system. She ground her teeth together as she lifted her arm. The Omnivice appeared, rectangular shapes of red and orange running from wrist to forearm. She scowled. Still no signal. She'd hoped a stray network emitter would be online, able to break through the interference that now engulfed the surrounding area. Perhaps the storm has concealed your ancestors' sight. A voice, not her own, whispered within her mind. It was soft and held a warmth like a flickering candle. She grimaced as her brow furrowed and a scowl stretched across her face. She'd lost concentration, allowing her emotions to create a gap within her chain circlet's defenses. Reaching up, she adjusted the ornate circlet until it was nestled right up against the bottom of her slender horns. Once finished, she glared down at the garnet affixed to her chest plate. She watched the inner fire as it crawled and wriggled within the orb each movement causing the amber glow to pulsate like a pupa trapped within a cocoon. Or a restless spirit within a crypt, she mused, causing her scowl to falter. She ignored the spirit as it continued to try speaking to her, its whisper slithering along their connection. She tactfully slammed down on the connection, hoping it got the hint. It rarely did. She gazed back down at the Omnivice, flickering through several screens and quickly exhausting her options. If she'd just been given a normal Omnivice, this wouldn't be a problem. Yet the Ecclesiarchy and the Technomancers insisted, even after a decade of devoted service to her master and his interests. The disappointment tinged with anger made her neck muscles tense as she slammed her fist against the wall. It reverberated with a dull thud. Above, she heard an auto turret whirr to life somewhere nearby. Regretting her outburst, she pressed herself against the wall. You're a binder, for goddess sake. Act like it. She waited until the thundering in her chest quieted. She sighed, took a deep breath, and then composed herself. Looks like I don't have a choice, she said as her head dropped. Resigned, she reached into the pouch on her hip. Withdrawing her hand, she gazed at the orb now in it. The spirit within writhed in anticipation. Here goes nothing, she said, tossing the seeker up into the air. The small drone bobbed up and down as if caught in some unseen current. This spirit she liked. It didn't ask questions or talk. It was a quiet thing, living to serve. To Korsha, it was a kindred spirit. It was a spirit who understood its reason for being. Korsha jumped up and down, flinging her arms around to warm them up. Once she was sufficiently warmed up, she ordered her thoughts and focused. She fixed the image of the gate within her mind. That was supposed to be her insertion point. She reached up her hand and the seeker dropped back down, hovering just above her open palm. She connected to the spirit within and gave it precise instructions. As she finished, she lowered her hand, drawing the seeker with it. As she spoke, her misty breath washed over the orb. I give you purpose. 
the orb rose into the air and darted off to the left. Korsha jumped into the air, propelled by her armor. The air rushed around her, her white braids flicking around her as she spun. Here goes nothing, she thought as her body came parallel with the wall. A heartbeat later, her boots landed with a hard thud against the wall with a dull reverberation. First tether established. Her eyes snapped to the seeker. She lunged forward, gravity pressed against her side as she weakened the binding. Reaching out, she hooked a second tether to the orb. The sudden momentum yanked her forward, nearly causing her to fall. Only years of training allowed her to achieve a rhythm quickly. Each step and subsequent push-off was precise and timed to ensure she didn't fall. She'd done that enough. Crashing was terrible, but crashing while running on a wall was doubly so. Yet she couldn't help but grin as a bitter cold twisted its fingers through her hair and horns. No one else in the academy had mastered the ability to create two tethers. This was her talent. It was also the reason they didn't trust her. Not only was she infused with the essence of the betrayer, but she'd been given a double blessing. The thought was like a leech, sapping what little enjoyment she'd gotten from being forced to use her power. So instead, she forced herself into her body, feeling the slight curve of the wall as she drew ever closer to her goal. The orb halted. The abrupt stop slammed against her as though she'd run into the water. She released her hold and jumped, bleeding off the last of the momentum. A flurry of ash and snow shot up around her as she hit the ground. She stood as fat flakes showered down around her. She'd reached the gate. She eyed the thick metal links of the gate that glittered in the bloody glow of the emergency lights. She checked her omnivice, drawing upon her powers had ensured she was still on schedule. I won't disappoint my master. Korsha snatched the orb from the air and shoved it into her pouch. Marching to the gate, she raised her hand. The crest of her master's house appeared on the back of her hand. A deep rumbling preceded the gate's withdrawal. Bit by bit, she could see into the power plant's inner courtyard. Her heart fell. It was empty, devoid of life. She'd hoped the recon drones had been mistaken. Where were all the maintenance crews? There should have been at least a dozen individual crews making sure the region's reserves were being constantly replenished. As it was, she had only hours before darkness descended and only essential services would remain online. Here, the snow was like small islands surrounded on all sides by a featureless blacktop, the warmth radiating up from the ground melting those flakes that were unlucky. Korsha marched across the barren courtyard, heading towards a squat, orange rectangular building. Her boots sloshed through puddles. She tried to ignore the six spires in the distance, but found herself being drawn to them. Their dark forms rose like twisted horns, challenging the churning snowstorm overhead. A brief wave of moonlight illuminated the courtyard, and she found herself frozen in place. The spire's blackened surface seemed to drink up the pale light, consuming it whole. Only the runes etched into the side of the structures glinted. Korsha's skin crawled at the sight of the arcane sigils. The hairs on the back of her neck rose. Her head thundered in her chest as her head snapped down to the ground before her. Six long shadows crawled across the ground, reaching for her like broken fingers stretching to grab. A sickening suspicion settled in the pit of her stomach. She hated the small trembling in her hands as she tilted her head up. She fixed her gaze upon the moon, the world's only source of light. She closed her eyes, burning its image into her mind as she lowered her head. She opened her eyes while clenching her teeth. The shadow should have been slanted off to the east, not facing towards the south where she was. Tor, she cursed, kicking at the ashy snow. Why can't I just have backup for once? A torrent of wind blew once more, bringing with it an end to the light. Its unrelenting howl grabbed at her hood, trying to rip it free and expose her to its icy touch. She narrowed her eyes, scanning the buildings huddled around the base of the spires. They promised her warmth and protection from the elements. Even as the cold gnawed at her cheeks and nose, she continued to gaze around, unwilling to move. A growing suspicion had gathered in the pit of her stomach. She was being led into a trap. Yet she couldn't linger. Every moment of indecision was a moment closer to people being without power, to children waking up as the winter's gnarled fingers gripped their fragile bodies, jolting them from a deep sleep. Biting the inside of her cheek, she cursed her master's appraisal of her skill. This whole mess would be easily resolved if someone just watched over her body. Then she could interact with Kesigal and the spirit world. Doing so would let her see whatever force was behind this disaster. You did have someone. The accusation coiled around her like a noose. In an instant, she wanted to do anything but be alone with those thoughts. Even springing a trap from a malevolent force lurking in the shadows was preferable. Korsha trudged across the courtyard. She grabbed the handle to the door and yanked it open. Part of her had expected something to be there, ready to ambush her and drag her inside, but there was nothing. She sucked in a deep breath and gazed into the storm. Somewhere between the shimmering brilliance, the ancestors watched. 
Say a prayer for me, she said, and then entered the building. The door slammed shut behind her, the final nail in her coffin. Gazing around the room, Korsha saw it in snapshots as a large monitor on the far wall flickered off and on. It looked as though a bomb had gone off, tearing the wall panels and furniture alike. She inched forward, glass crunching beneath her boots. She maneuvered between fallen chairs, careful to avoid the large ceramic pieces that were scattered about. They'd come from a long vase-like container, its lower half still clung to the lifeless, trampled body of the shrub that it had once housed. Soil spilled out beneath it like a pool of blood. From the few branches that stuck out, Korsha knew it was one of those fancy manicured shrubs, the kind important people had, trying to show off unique shapes to show that they, too, were more than the power they wielded. She bit back the fear welling up within her, choosing instead to fuel her anger. There is no purpose in this. Her voice crashed through the solemn silence like a tidal wave, and then quickly subsided as an unnatural hush descended upon the room. The suffocating stillness reclaimed its power, leaving nothing but a heavy, oppressive air as it settled back upon its throne. With careful, calculated steps, Korsha padded across the room to the monitor. She established a link between it and her Omnivice. After trying several commands, she forced it into a hard reboot. The screen flickered off, casting her into darkness save for the pathetically dull glow of her Omnivice. A sharp pang of anxiety beat within her chest as she remembered the spire shadows. She crossed her arms, pressing them against her chest plate, her nails dug into her biceps. The silence buzzed and hummed, growing in intensity until it was deafening. It accosted her like a swarm of insects. Clenching her jaw, she forced herself to take measured, even breaths. She'd been trained for this, yet she couldn't stop the feeling of being exposed. Helpless, a lamb led to the slaughter. She shook her head. She was useful. Her master wouldn't expend her in such a manner. That truth helped to dull the throbbing edges of her dread. The monitor flashed. Its light exploded, piercing the darkness and pushing it back. It enveloped her like a shield. She stepped forward, fingers now gliding across the keys as she searched for answers. Her eyes fixed upon a single flashing word, writing in the red font. Breach. Further investigation yielded that it had come from Spire 3. What had been imprisoned in that spire? The system had no answers for her. The rest of the network was still inactive. She'd need to venture further in and find the plant's Akrina. The monitor beeped, pulling her attention back to its pale glow. Her final search query had yielded a result. She licked her lips, throat now dry as she reached forward and tapped a key on the desk. There was static as the screen changed and then resettled upon the room she was in. It hadn't been destroyed. Not then, at least. She saw the vase with the shrub. Its oddly square shape was unimpressive. She turned her attention to the two men standing in the room. Their full body suits told her they were most likely Tex. One was sitting, making idle gestures at his companion, who was standing, drinking from a cup. An alarm went off. Its piercing shriek caused the workers to jump. A third man rushed into view, arms flailing in panic. Korsha was willing to wager that the person wearing the long-tailed uniform was the on-site manager. Damage report. Spire. The worker at the desk hesitated and then pointed. Spire 3. Which spirit is that? The now coupless worker asked. Lock everything down. Everyone is to evacuate. Is this really necessary? The manager turned to him. Are you an idiot? What kind of spirits do you think we have locked up in there? Big ones? Korsha shook her head at the answer. Size didn't matter to spirits. The manager never got to answer because the lights went out. Metal screeched and there was the shrill cry of breaking glass. Metal clanged as one of the workers called out to the goddess for protection. Emergency lights came on. Something flashed on the screen. Korsha's hand shot out, slamming on the pause button. She rewound until she reached the frame. The world was illuminated in a hellish light. Long arms stretched out, reaching for the men like hungry snakes. They were innumerable, jutting out from a central, jagged shadow that seemed to be in the process of tearing itself apart at its core. The shrub lay on the ground, decimated beneath an immense, gnarled hand looming overhead. Ice filled Korsha's veins as her eyes widened, taking in the horrifying sight against her will. Something like this, it, it would, to manifest, she blinked, her thoughts racing and at the same time she was empty, hollow. On autopilot, she resumed the feed, though this time on half speed. The emergency lights disappeared, then reappeared. The shadow was gone, only one of the men had reacted. One of the workers' bodies arced forward. He stumbled, trying to keep himself upright. A primal scream tore through the air. It was choked, cut off as the man's body was yanked away. The worker's body flew to the wall. Korsha winced, anticipating the crunch that never came. Instead, the man's body slipped into the darkness as though diving into a dark ocean. The lights flickered. 
this time, their return was lethargic and dim as though the light was being choked by darkness. Another scream. Whispers erupted from the walls and ceiling, from beneath the ruined shrub and toppled chairs. It hissed out from every piece of broken glass. The whimpers of the two remaining men drowned out whatever madness was being spread through the air. The sound of a million skittering claws scraping across the floor filled the room. They exploded as whatever was making the noise was rushing towards the camera. Someone screamed out to the goddess in desperation. The feed cut out and Corsa's entire body seized up. She was panting now. Her eyes darted back and forth, searching for the terrifying thing her imagination told her had come through the screen and was now hiding somewhere right next to her. She was still as the oppressive hush blanketed her within this benighted realm, a peasant in a court of shadows. Corsha trembled in the same murky depths that had entombed those three men. She stood in the same place those men had taken their last breath. No, she couldn't be sure of that. For all she knew, they had been taken into the spirit world to be playthings for the rest of their lives, trapped forever in a reflection of the moment they were stolen away. That was a fate worse than death. The horror echoed through her mind like an unrelenting storm, causing every muscle to tense. What if that happened to her? What if she was pulled into the shadows, never to pull her head free of their inky depths? Never to take another breath of fresh air? She couldn't do this, but she also couldn't fail. Duty and fear wrestled within her. She hadn't been prepared for this. No amount of training could have prepared her for this. Yet she couldn't leave. She had to restore power. The people needed her. Her master needed her. The only thing left was for her to find the bases of Krenna stored within the heart of the facility. It wasn't a long walk, but with a spirit that could snatch people into shadows, it might as well have been a trip all the way back to the capital. Once she reached the Akrena, she could access the plant's database. It would have a profile of the spirit. She needed to get to the Akrena. Without information, she was defenseless, like a fly into a spider's web. But how else was the fly to catch the spider? Korsha crept down the hallway, each step planted with careful precision. The shadows flickered, caught in the ghostly pale flame that writhed in her raised hand. Her eyes darted back and forth, eyeing the shadows. The drumming of her heart pounded in her chest, a relentless signal that she despised. Even with the witch light, the swirling azure glow did little to fight back the darkness. She could make out only the faintest of details. The dark marble of the tiles. The glint of hard metal walls that boxed her in. Yet that hadn't been the purpose of the fire she now wielded. It wasn't for seeing into this world. What it did reveal were the thick tendrils of smoke that twisted and slithered across the floor like serpents. Most flowed around her, though every now and then a few wrapped around her leg, pulling themselves up, eager to feast upon the fear that was radiating off of her. Their mouthless, eyeless, featureless bodies drawing ever closer. They worked to deepen the trench of horror that was forming within her, enriching their meal. Kicking them off only expended a fraction of her power. It was a poor use of her reserves, but the Vedra unnerved her. This was one allowance she would grant herself. There were other Vedra, dull crimson orbs that floated through the air like plump grotesque bubbles. They moved through rhythmic undulations that reminded Korsha of slugs. These were strange, animistic spirits that lurked on the edge of the veil, only manifesting when there was food. The sheer amount of them caused Korsha to shiver. The bloody orbs feasted upon pain suffering. Why any spirit would linger in the material plane, she didn't know, but she hated them all the same. Useless, purposeless things, she thought, as she swiped at a particularly fat bubble that came within inches of her face. Her hand passed through it, and it continued on as though nothing had happened. Her insides trembled with bitter fury. She struck again, this time watching in satisfaction as her power caused the thing to rupture, pouring out its dark, oily insides onto the floor. The other orb spasmed, headed for the spilled remains. What little use the Vedra had was in determining the strong emotions that lingered. They were emotional vultures, here to feed on the pain and terror that stained this place. The smoky tendrils had devoured the fear that had permeated the place. That was to be expected in such a situation, but what bothered Korsha more were the orbs. As she rounded a corner, she could see a faint glow in the distance. She padded forward, her eyes fixed upon the small fist-sized shining topaz. Like a dying sun, it struggled to hold the light. She was nearing her destination. The Akrena would be located at the heart of the plant, partly for ease of access, but primarily for security. That machine spirit was a valuable source of data and information to the wrong people. She drew closer to the light until she was passing beneath it. Its yellow glow flickered as it stained her gray skin. Korsha stopped dead in her tracks. She'd heard something behind her. It had been faint. She strained to hear, feeling the hairs on the back of her neck rise. 
For a long moment, there was nothing. Only she and the serpentine Vedra that were now swarming around her, coiling around her legs and now around her waist. Yet she ignored them, her concentration fully upon the sound she'd heard. It sounded like nails tapping against metal. There was a horrid rhythm to them as if they were produced by some demonic drum. It was slow, steady, drawing near. Icy lightning shot into her gut. Her hand shot out, yanking the lasher free from her hip. She opened her fingers, allowing the whip to fall to the ground as she now white-knuckled her grip. Silence. Where had it gone? She waited. Her heart thundered in her ears. Nothing moved. Her blood ran cold as she saw the Vedra that had swarmed her dropping away. They fled down the hall before her, abandoning their feast. She spun on her heel, dropping into a low crouch, just as she had been trained. Her eyes frantically scanned the area, searching for something, anything. She needed a target. The shadows deepened, swallowing up the light she'd left behind. Her eyes widened as the shadows crept forward, slowly consuming the hallway. She cursed as she took a step back. She couldn't see the spirit, and she couldn't assume that the spirit filled all of the shadows before her. For all she knew, it might not have sight. Striking might alert it to her presence. Would be real nice to have a partner right now, damn it. Korsha had a choice. She could either stand her ground, face the spirit, or she could run. This thing thrived in the shadows. She gulped as her terrified imagination saw thousands of hands hovering in the darkness, reaching out for her, serpents hidden, ready to strike and pull her in. She scolded herself. If the spirit had come within her witch light, it would have been revealed. Yet part of her wondered if the spirit could be strong enough to conceal itself even from her witch light. She didn't have time to pull out her lantern, nor did she want to feed more power into the flames. Taking a deep breath, she fixed the path in her mind. She counted in her head, feet bouncing as she readied herself. She dropped her hand, letting the witch light fade. A hissing shriek erupted from around her. Her fingers shoved their way into her pouch and she grabbed the orb. She flung it down the hall. A moment later, the tether was established and she was hurled forward. The force caused her to stumble. She hit her knees, the plating scraping against the floor as her body followed the orb. The sound of metal groaning and tearing filled the hall behind her. It was behind her. The sounds grew louder, more frantic, more furious. It was gaining. She had to create a barrier between them. Gazing forward, she saw a sign glowing above. Chem Lab. That would do. The orb shot into the room. As she entered, she released her hold upon it. Sliding on her knees once more, she reached into her pouch and retrieved two coins. Tethering them to the doors, she flung them. There was a loud screech, and then they slammed the door shut. She gasped as a hole within her reserves formed. It was like having a stitch in a lung, but instead it was in the pit of her stomach. Ignoring the sensation, she yanked her pistol free. She eyed the various containers and warning symbols as she fell back to the opposite side of the room where the seeker now waited. The acrid air of the abandoned lab caused her nose to burn. She stepped over several dark, oily puddles and tried not to think about who they used to be. The machinery within gave off an eerie hum as it continued its work. Her boots crunched tiny shards of glass that littered the floor in most places. Empty vials and beakers lay strewn about like forgotten toys. Behind her, the door screeched. It sounded as though a dozen hands were beating upon them, desperate to get in. She panted, lifting her pistol. Taking deep breaths, she tried to calm herself. The wavering of her pistol told her it wasn't working. Calm down faster! She screamed at herself. Large gashes formed in the metal. She leveled her pistol at a large container set against the side of the wall. She had to be patient. There was only one shot at getting this right. The doors caved in, pieces crashing and scraping across the floor. Korsha fired. Missed. Cursed. There was a piercing screech. She fired again. Boom. The room split apart as a plume of fire erupted out, a dozen mini-explosions detonating in its wake. The shockwave slammed into her, the force ripping her off of her feet and hurling her to the ground. With lightning speed, she grabbed onto the seeker and willed it to escape the inferno that had engulfed them. Her heart thumped wildly, a scream tearing itself free from her throat as she once more was drugged forward. The spirit shrieked in rage and horror behind her, yet the sound grew distant. She'd escaped. This time. She continued to slide across the floor as the seeker shot through the hall. She rolled over, gazing back at the distant fire. Her head sagged as she panted for breath. Adrenaline surged through her, dampening the edges of her vision with blurry darkness. Where was the spirit? The question was cut short as something slammed into her. Her head snapped back. An explosion of pain shot through her. The world went black. Korsha laid in an endless abyss. A coolness seeped into her cheek, numbing it. The inky darkness whispered echoing chants. 
Ancestral prayers? She groaned, trying to move, but her body wouldn't respond. She listened to her heart, losing herself in its constant, reliable rhythm. Where am I? She asked, though the words only came out in a garbled slur of spit and half-remembered lip movements. A wave of pain radiated through her body, searing through her now clenched muscles as though she'd been struck with lightning. Her body twisted with agony, a hoarse cry of pain scratched at her throat. She became aware of the throbbing pain that now racked her skull. Where was she? Her eyes shot open as fear jolted her body. Images of devouring shadows and of fire filled her mind. Where was it? Why couldn't she see the world? Adrenaline flooded into her as she forced herself to her side. She fought back tears as the abyss dissolved, its emptiness taking on a metallic quality as hard lines gave it form. Her eyes followed the yellow bands as they raced along the walls and up onto the ceiling. The emblem of the Imperial Goddess loomed overhead, six stylized wings flaring out behind her. She was alive, at least for now. Corsha smiled as she flopped onto her back, her eyes fixed upon the image of the Dominion's ultimate ruler. She wondered if the ancestors had whispered any prayers to her majesty. Part of her doubted the goddess would care. Corsha may have been one of her servants, but she wasn't a Tecromancer or a Yagrin. She may have been a binder, but the arcane power that coursed through her flowed from the betrayer. The forsaken daughter's essence swam through her veins, corrupting her and forever staining her soul. A cold shiver ran through her body. It numbed her, gnawing away at the sorrow within her. She didn't have time to feel sorry for herself. Instead, she shoved herself up and onto her knees. She clenched her eyes shut as she reached up to the ruby implanted in her chest armor. Her hand hesitated, hovering just over the gem. Despite her reservations, she knew that relying on the spirit was the correct choice, though she was painfully aware that every use gave it more influence over her. She couldn't use the standard painkillers and stimulants afforded to soldiers. The chemicals would interfere with her mind, activating some portions of her brain while subduing others. It created an artificial balance, one that would skew her ability to perceive the spirits and possibly stop her from using her magic. With a heavy sigh, she placed her hand on the ruby. I grant you purpose. The spirit, or Onaku as it liked to call itself, burst forth from the gym in a blaze of glorious light, its burning spidery form landing upon her chest plate. Warmth flooded into her wherever the spirit's legs touched her. Korsha watched the mesmerizing dance of its fiery body as the spirit stared at her, that one eye, black and soulless, bored into her. Fix my wounds. The thing's body shifted before it lunged forward. She sucked in a shocked gasp as the spirit entered her, disappearing into her chest plate. It scurried through her ribs and beneath her breastbone. Her body spasmed at the feeling as it crawled up along her spine and into her skull. It was in her mind now its legs flexing and weaving its power. The pain's sharp edge dulled, becoming a burning, then a tingling, before dissipating altogether. The world jolted, and Korsha was now standing upon a mountain. A chilly wind whipped about her. The ground crumbled beneath her feet. Stepping back, she gazed down, seeing a sheer cliff face. Below the mountain was stained in a harsh, reddish-orange glow. An overwhelming and unknown sadness gripped her, bringing her to her knees. A primal fear filled her. How could this have happened? The feeling coiled in the pit of her stomach, a reaction to the village burning below, one that felt all at once familiar and foreign. Her mind was overwhelmed, flooded with the intense emotions of bone-aching loss that cut her to her core. Sadness poured out of her, breaking her. She lost herself to the despair, as if she were watching parts of herself being destroyed in the fire that now consumed the village. A chorus of screams and the crackle of flames pierced her heart like a knife, and the smell of burning wood and flesh made her want to retch. It was a visceral reaction, a gut-wrenching response to a loss she could not understand. A loss that she could only compare to. Get. Out. Korsha growled. The illusion shattered, the cold wind dying mid-howl. The cliff shifted, elongated, and became metallic once again as Korsha clawed at her head. You are not fixed. Anaku said, his voice echoing within her mind. Get out, or I will tear you out and use your essence to fuel my suit. The thing lingered a second longer before scuttling its way down her spine. It slipped out from her neck, causing her to grunt in discomfort. A sick warmth flooded her mind, replacing the pain she now preferred, the lingering venom of its presence. Without being ordered, the spirit crawled down her chest. A second later, it lost shape as it became a small torrent of flame that shot into the ruby. Holy warrior, preservation of radiant might, cleanser of corruption, deliver me from my necessary sin, preserve me in the songs of your power, bind your wretched servant spirit to your will, for I and mine are yours forever. The prayer poured from her lips, each syllable perfectly enunciated, the rhythm precise. 
The consecration of the wretched had been driving into her mind over and over, a prayer suited for one like her. Pushing herself up, she stood. Though she didn't feel any different, she chose to believe that the goddess had at least heard her. Then the chain circlet upon her forehead tightened, the metal dug into her scalp. She winced as the pain made her eyes bulge. A breath later, it relented. She gasped. So too had Anaku's presence within her mind. Thank you, she whispered. Korsha gazed around the room. It was large and filled with monitoring equipment. Her heart sped up as a smile etched her features. Turning fully around, she saw the power plant's Akrena. The pale machine body dangled in the air, suspended from a mechanical arm embedded into its upper back. Long, thick tubes were suspended from a torso. The Akrena had two arms, though in the usual fashion they were cut off at the elbow, becoming wires. The machine's spirit hung there like a disfigured puppet. Korsha lifted her hand. A moment later, her Omnivice sparked to life. She tapped a series of orders into it. She eyed the display that marked the encryption program's progress. The Akrina's body shifted, slightly at first before jolting as if having been yanked from sleep. Its downcast and hanging head rose, revealing an elongated head and neck. A jagged, sharp-lined symbol etched into the plates of its forehead pulsed. A second later, its four sockets flickered to life. Korsha eyed the plaque above it. The words were written in a dull teal. Hyperus. Designation, Martyr. Died defending against the Kreshar invaders at Point Crown. Korsha didn't know where Point Crown was during the invasions, but from what little she'd learned about the war, there were no good battlefields, only good quick deaths. How may I serve you? Korsha's skin crawled. Every time she heard an Akrina speak, she swore she could hear the spirit within speaking like a bass beat hidden beneath a swell of treble, the spirit bleeding out from the machine. Status report. Spire 3 sustained structural damage. Repairs are at 93%. All other spirits are deactivated until the crisis is resolved. Are there any life signs within the perimeter besides my own? Hyperus's face shifted, the plates opening slightly, exposing the exoskeleton beneath. It raised its head into the air as though searching the ceiling for answers. Korsha waited in silence, praying that the goddess had been able to intervene. Negative. Korsha's heart fell. What a senseless waste. Her clenched fists trembled at her sides. Tell me about the spirit in Spire 3. Designation. Carcordus. Classification. Shadowbinder. I could have guessed that, Korsha muttered. Why was he inbound? According to records, Carcordus was an unregistered mage. He used his abilities to murder 16 people. Four were officials, and one was an Imperial Binder killed in the line of duty. He escaped his first imprisonment, but was recaptured and summarily executed. His spirit was sent here for penance. Korsha nodded. Some part of her expected this. The spirit was far too familiar. Most spirits, those native to the spirit wild, had a strange alien quality about them, thinking and seeing in strange ways. They just saw the universe in a fundamentally different way than mortals did. Any time one of those spirits broke free, they fled, choosing to escape rather than spread suffering. That was something almost uniquely bound to those who had lived on this side of the veil. There were certain exceptions to this, but they were as rare as a blood moon. She had to admit she understood them far better than she did this Carcordus. Korsha crossed her arms as she thought. She had to figure out how to stop Carcordus and rebind him to Spire 3. It was the only way to restore power. Checking the time, she saw she had only an hour and a half left. She licked her lips. Why had she been placed in this situation? Certainly a task force would have been better equipped for this. She shook her head. No, my master knows what he's doing. I have to trust his judgment. If he thought I was able to handle this, then I am. Tell me, Hyperius, how were authorities able to capture Carcordus? They burned the house he was in around him. Thirty minutes later, Korsha skulked through the ruins of the laboratory. Small, isolated flames danced, casting shifting shadows along the walls that unnerved her. She groaned as she nudged a charred hunk of half-melted hyperplastic. The label was illegible. In her haste to get away from the spirit, she had inadvertently, and literally, burned her only chance of containing the spirit. The Akrina had explained that Kokordus was a shadowmancer, a mage with the ability to bend shadows to his will. It was just as the Ecclesiarchy and Technomancers had warned her. The corruption of the magic had become so much that it had irrevocably stained his soul. So much that after he died, he had become the embodiment of his sin. Now she was sure that he'd been watching her from the moment she had set foot inside the plant's grounds. The spire shadows were a manifestation of him. But if that was the case, why hadn't he attacked her? 
The Okrina had confirmed that Karkortis had dragged every worker he came across into the shadows, their screams cut off as they slid inside one by one. It was a horrifying thought. Like drowning in an endless dark sea, being dragged down into the black depths where no one could hear you or would ever see you again. She shook her head. She had to focus. There was another, more concerning question she needed to figure out. What did he do with them after that? As far as she could tell, he wasn't able to store mass within the shadows, only control them. Though he was now a living shadow, she suspected that the limitations he'd been born with persisted. 36 dead. 36 bodies. He was racking up quite the kill count tonight. Korsha thought back to the last thing Hyperus had told her. Fire. That had been the answer for when he was alive, but was it still a valid option? Korsha had a suspicion it was. Why else had he not followed her? Right after the encounter, she'd been knocked unconscious. After questioning the spirit within the Seeker, she had learned that she'd struck a wall as it rounded a corner. It had continued despite this, mostly in fear of the spirit who had been pursuing them. For that, she was thankful. For her part, a deep, loathsome anger knotted her stomach. It had been a rookie mistake. She hadn't been paying attention, and so she didn't compensate for the turn. How many times had she crashed in training? Hundreds, at least. She huffed through flared nostrils. Yet her training had never consisted of shadows tearing the world apart in the eager anticipation of sucking the flesh from her bones. Come on, she whispered. There has to be something here. She crossed the room, flinging open one cabinet. The insides of the cabinets were free from the sooty dust that now coated everything else. Her legacy stain upon the lab. Standing on her tiptoes, she reached in. Her gloved fingers brushed against the jagged edges of broken glass. She scowled, pulling her hand back. She eyed the table that was on its side next to her. Could she risk making a loud noise? Did the spirit know where she was? Would he come back? She couldn't help but gaze at the doorway she'd first entered. Its frame was bent and empty, like a broken, toothless maw. The shadows outside seemed to swell like a throat preparing to swallow her up. She marveled at the deep gashes the spirit had inflicted upon the metal walls. Was he there watching her right now? In the end, she gave up, unwilling to risk it. There had to be another way. She'd found her lasher on the way back, but with Carcordus being able to manifest himself with many hands, it was useless. It would stop one hand only for a dozen more to grab her. Replacing it on her hip, she contemplated if she could find a safe place where she could drop into Keshkigal, the underworld. There she could get guidance. Such a journey would require hours, hours that she'd be left vulnerable. Think, think, think. Fire was still her best and only option, though how was she going to use that advantage? That was the life-saving question. She could leave, go find wood in the nearby forest. Again, that would take too long. Her eyes widened. Her arms shot up and she tapped frantically into her omnivice. She gazed at the list of Spire prisoners. Two would be far more detrimental than helpful. It was the last one that caught her attention. A primordial. The spirit had been captured due to it causing rogue storms to develop on some distant planet. Korsha smiled, feeling relief for the first time since she'd started this mission. That'll work. Now all I have to do is free it, bind it, and hope its lightning will work. With a plan in hand, Korsha marched out of the laboratory and down the hall. She continued, keeping a watchful eye on the shadows until she found an exit. The cold greeted her with an eager hug, its icy touch stealing the breath from her lungs. Her chalice armor's engines flared, once more working overtime to protect her. She lifted her hood up, allowing its shielding to protect her face and keep the fat flakes of ash and snow from touching her. She trekked across the paved courtyard, heading straight for the spires. The shadow shifted, following her journey. What was he waiting for? Irritation spiked within her as a new thought struck her. She didn't even know if that was him or just a byproduct of his magic running rampant through the area. The lack of knowledge made her all the more nervous. Yet she smothered it in her righteous fury. She was going to bind this spirit and force it into submission, even if it was the last thing she ever did. She reached the edge of the spires, their dark forms towering over her like the curved blades of the second sun, the Lord Justicar. They were arranged around the perimeter of a centralized pit that had been excavated. The pit itself seemed as though it went on forever, and it made Korsha shiver as she stared down into its abysmal depths. Yet she knew it wasn't too deep, as the construction wasn't focused on puncturing through the mantle. Instead, its purpose had been to lay the necessary equipment to harness this world's ley line. Following the curve of the walkway, she withdrew her nail from its sheath. The long, slender blade glowed with the iridescent red glow of the Imperial Goddess herself. 
the forge priests of the Ecclesiarchy had somehow imparted a sliver of the Imperial Goddess's wrath into the blade. Any spirit struck would feel the infinitely sharp edge of her displeasure. If Carcordus was going to take her, she was at least going to take a little of him with her, though that was not the kind of equivalent exchange she wanted to make. Her boots pounded out a steady rhythm that matched her heavy pants as she raced toward her destination. Overhead, a beam of moonlight broke through the storm, bathing the world around her in a pale glow. Her boots struck a rock, sending it soaring through the air before hitting the side of the pit. She slowed, watching it tumble down until she lost sight of it. The moonlight swept across, exposing more and more of the trench until she could see the glint of the white rock that made up the bottom. The blood drained from her face and she sucked in a breath. There, at the bottom of the pit, were bodies littered across the ground. As the tear in the sky widened, more and more light illuminated the bodies. With every passing minute, a new horrifying realization settled within her. Carcordus hadn't thrown the bodies in haphazardly. There was a dark symmetry to it. Her skin crawled as she saw the graceful lines of an arcane circle formed from the butchered remains of his victims. Without another thought, she took off. This time, fear propelling her forward, she had to reach the spire. She now knew the reason he hadn't pursued her. It was a trap, and she'd stepped into it. A witless fly who had thrown herself willingly into his web. Her hand shot down into her pouch, where she pulled a coin. She hurled it, tethered herself, and used the momentum to shoot into the air. The wind shot past her, threatening to pry her hood back. The world blurred and her mind raced. That was a full arcane circle below. A full one. Its intricacies were beyond her understanding, but its dangers weren't. In that moment, she knew her master had made a mistake. She was going to fail. And what was worse, she was going to let him down. A prayer escaped her lips, a commendation to the goddess for everything he'd done for her. She'd go into the afterlife singing his praises. Her momentum slowed as the coin descended. She plucked it from the air and threw it once more. She had to do this several times, each making sure she didn't throw the coin in such a way as to have her flying over the pit. Spire 3 rose up, becoming more giant with each throw. As she approached, she could make out a litany of bots working to fix it. Their arc welders sparked in the night. Hope shot up within her. Perhaps she could use that. She snatched the coin from the air and allowed herself to fall. Making a split-second decision, she threw the coin again. She had a plan. It was a good one. She didn't know if the bots welders were fixed to them or if they would even listen to her. She could override their programming, but she was not a technomancer. Utilizing them at their full capacity was also beyond her. The bot's various chirps and whistles called out to her. Several swiveled their flat heads, their photoreceptors fixed upon her as she jetted past. She was within the shadow of Spire 3. She grabbed the coin again and threw it with all her might. She didn't know whether or not he could use such a thin shadow, but she wasn't willing to chance it. She was closing in on Spire 4. All she had to do was reach it, deactivate the lockdown protocol. She hoped her master's codes would be enough. With one final throw, she launched herself forward. That throw had been off, and so she untethered herself from the coin, watching as it sailed down into the crater below, its use to her having been spent. She tucked her body and rolled as she landed. Her armor absorbed the kinetic force of her landing and allowed her to use her momentum to jump up to her feet. Korsha realized her well of mana was nearly spent. Groaning, she grabbed the railing and took the stairs two at a time. She cursed as she raced into the shadows. The control panel's display glowed only meters away. Hello, little girl. Are you lost? A shrill voice called behind her. There was an oiliness to it that seemed to wash over her. Her muscles burned, screaming in fatigue as she made the last several steps. What do you think you're doing? A wheeze rushed out of her as her torso was constricted. Her pace decelerated as if struggling through water. Her armor vibrated as symbols, sacred and empowered with the goddess's might, pierced the darkness. Carcordus screamed in agony. Pesky chalice armor. I'll be taking that. A large, scythe-like arm appeared from the shadows before her. As it rose, she tethered herself to it and jumped. She watched as its edge came down mere centimeters from her face. She reached the zenith of the movement. Her fingers desperately fumbled in her pouch for another coin. That moment of stillness, of equilibrium, was gone, replaced by that horrible, dreadful sense of falling. She tossed the coin into the air and latched onto it. Another arm reached for her, but she swung her nail. The blade slid through the mass of darkness with a terrible hiss. Korsha watched as she was propelled away from the control console. The railing of the building flew past her. She cursed and tore the lasher from her side. She brought her arm back and flicked it out. This tether flung her. Her arms and legs flailed, each seeking to find their own balance. Her body jerked and spun forward. She wasn't going to make it. She screamed as her arms stretched, but all she caught was air. She smashed into the ground with a thud. 
blood welled in her mouth hot and thick. She spit it out as she pushed herself up. The console was just above her. She lifted her hand and activated her Omnivice. Her master's emblem appeared. The connection symbol was flashing. Something wrapped around her foot. Her head shot up. She gazed up at the display but couldn't make out the message as she was dragged away. She screamed, tried to break herself from the iron grip of the spirit, but it was useless. A second later, she was hauled over the edge and into the pit below. Korsha gagged, bile rising in her throat as the putrid stench of rotting flesh permeated her senses. Lifting her aching neck, she gazed up at the towering spires overhead, their jagged edges slicing through the sky like a razor-sharp mandible of some monstrous insect. A deep, radiating pain shot through her, and she knew she was going to be left with a brutal bruise. If I survive this place. A tremor racked her body as she gazed around. She couldn't see anything save for the storm clouds above. The hood that had once shielded her face now hung uselessly around her neck. The hood had been split, leaving two ragged edges that whipped about as the cold gnawed on her exposed face. She grit her teeth, determined not to let fear take control. If she was going to make it out alive, she needed to stay focused. As she turned her head, her eyes were drawn to the lifeless, glassy stare of a near-human worker. Those unfocused eyes seemed to draw her in. His skin was a deep shade of red, his face youthful and handsome, now twisted in a horrific expression of pain and agony. The beginning of a beard lined his chin and cheeks, as if frozen in time along with the rest of him. His mouth was open, stretched beyond what any mouth should be capable of, its features captured in a silent scream. Intense anguish and suffering seemed to pour out of him like some contractible disease, creeping through the air and infecting her with its horror. The sight struck her as a visceral, raw, gut-wrenching reminder of what she was facing. This wasn't just a spirit. This was the spirit of a mad mage. Finally. Korsha spun. She saw her nail laying beside her. Grabbing it, she forced herself up and wielded its baleful crimson light before her. Now, now, I wouldn't want to have to hurt you. Korsha blinked as her brow furrowed. That made no sense. Why wouldn't he want to hurt her? Wasn't that why he dragged her down here? He'd obviously waited to activate his foul ritual until he'd brought her here. But why? She cursed the technomancers for not letting her study arcane theory. If they'd only believed in her faithfulness, she wouldn't have used it to rebel as her predecessors had. She was loyal. They had deprived her of a tool and now she was going to die for it. A burst of light manifested, causing her to shield her eyes. Her heart raced. Had her plan worked? Was the primordial free? Dread filled her as she watched the light persist. It was off to her left. Another light appeared off to her other side. Then another, and another, and another. She had a sinking feeling in her gut as she dropped her hand from her face. A black void floated before her in the shape of a man seated in a lotus position. The thing floated in the air. Arms, so many damned arms, extended from its back. Carcordus. The floodlights that lined the edge of the crater had forced him into a more solidified form. Korsha's mind raced. He was up to something. He didn't seem the type to give up an advantage for no reason. The arms behind him flexed and shot out in all directions. Korsha dropped back, the nail's tip scratching the air before her as she anticipated the attack. Yet the arms hadn't come for her. A purple haze appeared at the edges of the ritual site. What are you doing? Carcordus's head lifted. His eyes were unseen, yet piercing her all the same. It made her shrivel up inside. He chuckled as two more hands appeared. They reached towards her. A second later, her body jerked. She gasped as those unseen hands squeezed her. Then it hit her. My armor creates a shadow inside. She struggled as she was lifted off the ground. Gently, she was moved forward, the edges of her boots scraping along the ground and bouncing as they hit one of the corpses. It'll all be over soon. My death will grant you nothing. You won't get away. They'll hunt you down like the wretch you are. Carcordus howled in triumph, a vile, depraved cackle that sent chills down Korsha's spine. Tears burned her cheeks as she futilely fought against the magic that held her hostage. If she'd had someone here to protect her, she would have survived. You did, and you betrayed her. Her jaw tightened, eyes darting around as she looked in vain for something, anything, that she might be able to use. With a strength born of adrenaline and fear, she used every last ounce of her will to bring her nail up, hoping she could press it against her armor. The goddess's wrath might seem in, and I'll be taking that. A searing pain erupted in her hand as her clenched fingers were forced apart, the bones aching from the jarring movement. No, no, no! 
Tears of agony streamed down her face, and a silent scream tore through her soul as the hilt of the blade was torn from her grip. With a deafening crash, her hope clattered to the ground. Tell me, Binder, would your people suspect you? She stared at him, her face twitching as she tried to understand his question. Around her, the edges of the ritual area began to fray, as if reality was tearing itself apart. Currents of stormy energy whipped through the air, slashing and howling as they picked up speed. Carcordus sat motionless, unaffected by the power surging around them. He was the eye of the storm. The answer to her question hit her like a knife to the gut. You're going to switch our bodies. Clever one, don't worry, I'll make good use of that. They'll see through it. They'll question you about why you failed to rebind the spirit. He cocked his head to the side, a wide smile splitting the shadows of his face. But there is going to be a spirit bound to Spire Three. A scream tore itself free from her lips as another current of power raked its claws against reality. She was nearly out of time. She had to find a way out of this, but there was nothing she could do. Trembling, she tilted her head back, gazing up into the churning dark clouds one last time. She watched the snow and ash falling down around her, somehow unaffected by the ritual's building energy. In that moment, she had only one regret, that she would not be able to die beneath the starlight. The clouds burned as silver veins surged through them. Thunder bellowed, and then the world exploded as a sunburst of light encompassed everything. It was followed by the deafening roar of a primordial. Her body was thrown to the ground. Cushioned by one of the corpses, the world fell into darkness once more. Carcordus screamed and his hands grabbed at her, pinning her down. Then there was another flash of lightning. This time, Corsha jumped to her feet. You will not leave, Carcordus said in a pained, rasping voice. Lightning struck like blessed judgment. Another burst of energy struck the tip of the spire above. In the flash of light, Portia saw Carcordus's body shrivel. It had been reduced to a humanoid shape. No extra arms. Portia knew why the fire had been the Shadow Mancer's undoing. Fire, as a light source, was chaotic at heart. It was in a never-ending, ever-changing dance that birthed and killed shadows in the same breath. Carcordus had no chance of grabbing them. Another lightning strike. Portia watched as the hands he'd formed were washed away in the brilliance. Sprinting forward, she reached down, grabbed her nail, and raced towards Carcordus. He was turning, fleeing. The battle having turned against him, she shifted the grip on her blade, arced her hand back and through. As the blade left her hand, she tethered herself to it. Her feet left the ground as she closed the distance. Her hand shifted, reaching up and placing the palm of her hand on the bottom of the hilt. Her momentum bled away, but it didn't matter. Just as the blade struck Carcordus, she thrust her hand forward, ensuring the blade buried itself up to its hilt. His body spasmed. Tendrils of shadow leapt out as though his body were struggling to hold itself together. She released her blade, raised her hands before her palms facing the storm. The shackler at the base of her back clicked, opening. She panted, licking her lips, she growled. The connection between her and the shackler's hand had been made. Raising her hands, the chain slithered up into the air. With a quick strike, the shackler shot forward, the clamp slamming and then biting down around Carcordus's leg. Another slammed into his arm. With a gesture, they retracted, slowly pulling him towards her. Not so fun, is it? Portia spat, dropping a hand to the utility belt. Please, no. You don't know what it's like in there. She snatched up an empty shard and held it up before her. She wondered what color he'd be. Carcordus had fallen to the ground, his ethereal hands clawing in desperation as he tried to find any purchase that would delay the inevitable. He passed over the bodies of innocent workers he'd slain, clawing at their bodies as he went. She flicked her hand up, causing the shacklers to throw him up into the air. As he was reeled in, there was a moment that their eyes had met. She realized that this could have been her if it hadn't been for her master finding her. She suppressed the shiver that had wanted to shake her. Instead, she glared at him, her head tilting down to watch his approach. I shall give you. She paused as she tossed the shard toward him. It split into a thousand pieces, vibrating fractions hovering in the surrounding air. An instant later, it slammed down upon him, forcing his spirit inside. Portia stepped toward the now hovering crystal. Her eyes watched the flickering black and orange colors that pulsed within. Portia smiled as she reached up and brought the shard to her face. It had taken her nearly 30 minutes to restore the power. Fortunately, that had meant that the region had only suffered a blackout for 23 minutes. 
Rebinding the primordial storm spirit to its spire had been simple enough, as it had only partially been released. She reveled in the fact that Carcordus had doomed himself by interrupting the connection. Korsha had only been able to activate a partial containment breach when he had yanked her away. If he'd waited just thirty more seconds, the primordial would have been free and most likely run off, leaving her defenseless. Korsha leaned against the wall, exhaustion covering her like a cloak. She gazed up at the transport with an anticipation she hadn't known she could feel. Thoughts of a warm bed and sleep filled her, but all she could do in that moment was let out a weary breath. The transport circled overhead, kicking up snow and ash in a flurry as it landed. Snow pelted her skin, causing her to wince. The old familiar hatred of the cold in winter sidled up next to her like an old forgotten friend. How many places could be as cold as the Academy had been? A hot gust of air billowed around her. The ship was bulky with hard angles. She savored the smell of burnt ozone as the transport's landing gear touched down. She stumbled forward, her armor doing most of the work to keep her upright. Work crews poured out of the ship, racing out in all directions as they set to work getting the plant back in order. She saw several of them stop and stare down into the pit. Even from here, she could see the faint glow of the fire. Burn the bodies, her master had ordered. It's the only way to cleanse them of Carcordus's corruption. She faithfully obeyed, offering prayers over the bodies as she set about the grisly work of pouring chemicals on them. She'd found another lab on the other side of the complex. It had filled her with both rage and relief as she saw the unbroken vials and containers. If they'd just given me a map with actual details, then this wouldn't have been such a nightmare. Even after all these years, they still didn't trust her. They probably never would, but her master did, and to her, that's all that mattered. Yet she couldn't help but feel that not knowing was going to be her downfall one day. That fear settled in the pit of her stomach, promising to rear its ugly head later. For now, she needed rest. She hopped into the transport and gave the pilot a thumbs up. He nodded and the door slid shut. She plopped down into one of the cushioned seats leaning back against the headrest and letting her head loll to the side. The transport turned and she could see the raging inferno below. Her skin had crawled as shadows danced like demons along the edge of the pit. The view was cut off by one of the spires. The Academy had never taught her what a spirit experienced while being contained, and as far as she was concerned, she planned to keep it that way. Where are we headed? The ship's pilot, a full-bodied Akrena, shifted, its head swiveling all the way around so that it could see her. I am to return you to Lord Anadrov but I have been tasked with taking recon of the area before I can leave. Korsha nodded as she fell back once more into the blessedly soft seat. Her master would expect a report on her efforts. Afterwards, she could lose herself in sleep. She leaned over and rested her head against the window. The cold seeped in, numbing her forehead. She stared out, watching the snow raining down straight past like hyperspace stars. As the ship banked, she caught a glimpse of the outer perimeter. She could just make out where she thought she'd first approach the wall. Had it really been only hours? Then she saw something, something that made her sit straight in her chair. Her arm swatted the air, desperate to get the pilot's attention. Circle the perimeter of the power plant. My orders are circle, she said in a low, threatening tone. The perimeter. Whether the Akrina had been programmed to still feel fear or not, he complied. Korsha muttered a prayer to the goddess as her eyes scanned the area. She hoped the ancestors were watching. Several transports had landed on the outside of the barrier. Their engines cleared the area. Korsha's body ran numb as dread flooded back into her. She now knew how Carcordus had escaped. Yet this revelation manifested a series of far darker implications. Down below, the transports that had landed had kicked up the snow, exposing the raw ground beneath. There, on the ground, she saw a section of a ritual circle. The purple lines were thick with smaller circles coming off of them. Those would be the qualifiers for the spell's formation. Korsha's mouth was dry, her heart pounding in her chest. Out there, hidden amongst the citizens of the Dominion, were forces that not only understood the intricate practices of Sincraft, but they also knew how to wreak havoc upon the Dominion's infrastructure. The one who had committed this act had clearly done so with a purpose in mind, whether it was to make a statement or perhaps a declaration of war. I hope that you've enjoyed Korsha the Weaving of Shadows. Like all my stories, this takes place in the Legends of the Fall shared universe. Be sure to check the links in the description below. If you like the story, then please consider joining our Patreon where you'll get access to all the stories I've created plus all the deep lore that I've written. Once more, thank you for listening and I hope that you have a great day. Archivist out.